السلام عليكم ورحمة الله بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله الذي العظيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا ونبينا أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد وآله الطيبين الطاهرين لا سيما بقية الله في الأرضين أجل الله تعالى فرجه الشريف وجعلنا من أعوانه وأنصاره اللهم أخرجني من ظلمات الوهن وأكرمني بنور الفهم اللهم افتح علينا أبواب رحمتك وانشر علينا خزائن علومك برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين Seeking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's guidance and trusting Him, we start our second session on lessons on Islamic beliefs. Like last week, we start with a hadith about knowledge. This hadith is narrated by Shaykh Kulayni, rahmatullah alayhi, the great scholar who compiled Al Kafi, and he quotes from several people. Finally, it's from Abi Abdullah alayhi salam, from Imam Sadiq alayhi salam. Qal, qal Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Very famous hadith, which needs reflection. Man salaka tariqan Whoever embarks on a journey takes a path seeking knowledge. So either in his own or her own town, like you coming from different places to this center, or maybe even traveling from one town to another town, or maybe from one country to another country, maybe from one continent to another continent. So there is no limit for this. Even Rasulullah you know, said, Utlubul ilm And at that time, China was perhaps the remotest place. So there must be no restriction, no limit in learning as far as geography is concerned and of course as far as also time is concerned So whoever embarks on a journey and his or her intention is to seek knowledge and if you listen to the hadith carefully you see just seeking knowledge by itself is a virtue. It doesn't say whoever makes a journey and he becomes alim has this reward. Just Just the fact that you are interested in learning. Maybe you learn, maybe you don't learn. For example, by the time you arrive there, the class is finished. Or maybe your life is finished. You go to Hose and God forbid your life is finished. Maybe your teacher dies. Anyway, what is important is that you have made this decision and you made some practical steps towards this by traveling. Then, if you do so, Rasulullah says, من سلك طريقا يطلب فيه علما سلك الله به طريقا إلى الجنة. Then Allah would put him on a path that leads him to or her to heaven. One side is seeking, which does not necessarily lead to learning, but the other side is decisive. It doesn't say Allah put him in a, for example, route that might lead to heaven. No. 
certainly such person who has sincere intention for learning and acts upon it and takes some measures, Allah would put him on a path that would lead to heaven. وَإِنَّ الْمَلَائِكَةِ لَتَضَعُ أَجْنِحَتَهَا لِطَالِبِ الْعِلْمِ رِضًا بِهِ The angels who are pure servants of God, who are near to God, إِبَادٌ مُقَرَّمُونَ إِبَادٌ مُقَرَّمُونَ These are very honored servants of God, they are very near to God. When they see there are people who have traveled in order to learn, they spread their wings under the feet of these people. They put their wings, they open, they spread their wings for the seeker of knowledge. <laughs> because they are very pleased with this. When they see that there are human beings who try to learn so that they know how to serve Allah better, how to be more virtuous, then out of respect, out of love, and perhaps for support, imagine if you have wings of angels under your control, what can you do? You can be affecting people in all corners of the world if the angels' wings are with you. You can be in one place and light from you can spread all over the world if the angels are with you. So, Because they are pleased with this. وَإِنَّهُ يَسْتَغْفِرُ لِطَالِبِ الْعِلْمِ مَنْ فِي السَّمَاءِ وَمَنْ فِي الْأَرْضِ For a seeker of knowledge, all the inhabitants of heaven and all the inhabitants of earth ask forgiveness. They ask Allah to forgive this person who is a true seeker of knowledge. <coughs> Imagine if you have so many people who do istighfar on your behalf. Then inshallah you will be forgiven. Because these are the people who have no selfish reason for asking forgiveness for you. And these are the people that are certainly inspired by Allah. Who inspired all the people in the sky and all the people in the earth to ask forgiveness for such people. For sure this is something coming from Allah himself. And when Allah wants to forgive, He inspires people to ask forgiveness for you. You know, Allah says to Rasulullah, "Fa'fu anhum lahum." Forgive them and ask me to forgive them. <laughs> he wants to forgive, but he looks for an excuse. He says, "You know, ask me to forgive them." Now Allah inspires these inhabitants of the sky and earth to ask forgiveness for such person. Like you know, when your child goes away from home, rebels, and you want him back, but you don't want to spoil him. So you ask a neighbor, a friend, you know, ask him to come back and tell me to forgive him. He may not ask me for forgiveness, but you tell me to forgive him, I will forgive him quickly. But I need someone to do something here you know, as a kind of intercession. So these people will be receiving the prayer of inhabitants of the sky and the earth for their forgiveness. And these inhabitants are not only human beings or angels or jinns, it includes even animals. Even fish in ocean. It means that the whole creation shows appreciation to someone who is learning. The whole creation. Imagine if we establish a university and there is a student who studies hard 
Isn't it that all university should show appreciation? Professors, staff, librarian, even security, everyone should show appreciation to a student who studies very hard. Because university is established for what? For learning. And if in the university you are learning, so you should be appreciated. This world, this creation is established for what? For learning. You may say, Mulana, what is the reason? I give you the reason. It's from the Quran. Allah, who خلق السبع سماوات ومن الأرض مثلهن يتنزل الأمر بينهن. In end of Surah Talaq. Allah is the one who created seven skies and seven earth, and whatever comes down from the sky to the earth. Why? لتعلم أن الله على كل شيء قدير وأن الله قد أحاط بكل شيء علما. He created all this so that you know. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala embraces everything in his knowledge and his power encompasses everything. So this world, this universe is created for our learning. So if you learn and show interest in learning, whole universe appreciates. Everything would try to help you. وَفَضْلُ الْعَالِمِ عَلَى الْعَابِدِ The privilege of alim compared to a person who is a worshipper. First of all, I have to say, those who worship God so much so that they can be described as abid. They are very high in the rank. You know? If someone is Abid, sometimes maybe in one community of hundred people or you know even a thousand people, we may not have Abid, a person who doesn't commit any sin and a person who is very much devoted to worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's very high position. We do not underestimate this. But even if we have Abid, someone who is Constantly praising God, worshiping God, praying, committing no haram, committing nothing disliked. Even if we have such person compared to an alim, they are not the same. Alim is much higher. Fadlul alim ala al-abid kafadl al-qamar ala sa'ir al-nujum. The privilege of Alam over Abed, a worshipper, is like moon compared to stars. Laylatul Badr, when moon is complete, even a crescent is bigger and more shining than many stars. For example, if this is the night, fifth night of the month or sixth month at the night. Still is shining, but if it is night of fourteenth, the moon is complete. The difference between moon and other stars is big. So this is the difference between alim and abid. True scholars, our heirs of the prophets, they have inherited the legacy of the prophets. What's the legacy of the prophets? Of course, the prophets didn't leave behind golden or silver coins. They left behind as the legacy knowledge. And ulama are the people who have inherited the knowledge of the prophets. Whoever has gained something from knowledge has gained a lot. So this shows how important it is to dedicate our life to learning. But of course everything has conditions. Everything has etiquettes. 
everything has signs of being progressing in the right way. It's not that everyone who memorizes something or everyone who puts a mama in his head is alim. There are lots of conditions for that. But if someone is a true alim, then the rank is very high and it's very close to the prophets. Okay, now we go to our discussion about aqalat. I have uh, five questions for you, and inshallah you will be receiving this question by email, and you will be told how to answer. This time you will receive the questions after the class, but inshallah next time when you come, be prepared, maybe at the beginning of the class, we will ask you to answer to the questions, because I am sure you also agree that just attending the class without reading in between and preparation and discussion is not going to be very successful. It's good, you get the reward of attending the class, inshallah, but it's not enough. Learning is something that needs repetition. You know, in Hose, our teachers you know, used to tell us all the time, you learn one thing, but you repeat it 1,000 times. Instead of taking 1,000 lessons and forgetting them, take one lesson and repeat it 1,000 times. Imagine if you had learned and memorized 10% of what you have heard in your life. Just if you remember 10% of that, you were now a great scholar. But you keep hearing or reading, but at the same time forgetting. My late grandfather said that in their town, there was an alim, a big mujtahid, and people were surprised that he never says something, you know, which has been said before. He always says you know, new things, you know. So they told him, you know, you have been giving us lectures over years and every time it's new. He says, no, it's not new. You keep forgetting. <laughs> I am repeating the same things, you know, every now and then. But you keep forgetting, you think it's new. So, it's very important that you review, you repeat, and also discussion. Discussion is very important. So, you should have one or two, maximum three friends with whom? You discuss. So Tuesday you take the lesson, maybe Wednesday, Thursday you study, then Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday you have time, half an hour discussion with someone or two people, three people, either in person or on telephone. This discussion is very important because it helps you to understand, helps you to check if there is any you know, ambiguity gives you ability to present, and when something is discussed, it settles in your mind, inshallah. So, please review, please have discussion. Now that Alhamdulillah you are coming, so you are doing great part of it, take care of the rest so that inshallah you would have better result and answer. When you plant a flower, you cannot just keep planting and forgetting the flowers that you have planted. You have to go and visit them, feed them, water, everything, then grow. So this knowledge that you are planting every week, you cannot forget it and say, okay, I plant new knowledge. You have to go back and check and review and inshallah discuss. Okay. Alhamdulillah, we finished the first lesson which was on unity of God or Tawheed and now we move on to the second principle which is about justice. As we said last week, the reason for choosing these five principles as principles of our faith, as principles of our madhab, is because we needed something that can give us 
a distinct identity. If you were just focusing on three major principles of Islam, that is Tawheed and Nabubwa and Ma'ad, then this was not giving us a distinct identity. We were like other groups, other schools of Islam. So we focus on those three, definitely. Those three are very important for us. But also we add to those three two more principles and we say whoever believes in these five, then he is an imami or a Shia, a follower of Ahlul Bayt One is justice, the second is imam. So why so much emphasis on justice? Is there any Muslim who disagrees with us? Who would say, for example, God is not just? No. We don't have any Muslim who says God is not just. Because this is mentioned in the Quran that God does not do any injustice. Actually, in the Quran, you find many places that God says he's not unjust, he doesn't do injustice. You don't have any place that says God is just. Did you know that? God is not described in the Quran as being adil. God is described as being not zalim. And this is a point. And maybe the reason is God is greater than just being described as adil. He's much more than adil. But to leave no chance for any ambiguity, the Quran mentions that God is not zalim in many different ways. And so on and so forth. So, there is no Muslim, whether it be a lay person or a theologian, who would say that God is not just. So why Shia and Mu'tazilites emphasize so much on divine justice? The answer is that this was the core of a big discussion, a very heated debate among early Muslim thinkers and theologians uh, on how to understand the justice of God, how to define, how to interpret this justice of God. <coughs> Asharites, although believed in divine justice, but the way they interpreted divine justice was actually leaving no real meaning for justice. It was making the concept void. It was making the concept something which is absurd. Why? Because their idea is, and still we have many Asharites in the world, their idea is that God is just only by definition. Why? Because whatever God does is just. So God is just because justice is what is done by God or what is prescribed by God. So they sort out the problem just by definition. Had God asked us to tell lies, had God asked us to not, not to keep our promises, had God asked us to harm each other, that would be justice. There is no real objective difference between justice and injustice for Asharites. It's just a matter of how God decides and how God introduces justice and injustice to us. He could have decided in a very different way compared to what we have in the Quran. There is no reason why he couldn't have said differently. There is no reason why, for example, God could not send pious people to hell and criminals, for example, to heaven. They said, it's up to God. Whatever he decides, that's good, that's just. This idea, which also exists in Christianity and Judaism, so there are also some people there who believe the same idea and is known in Western thought as divine command theory, which has of course different versions. Some versions are more limited and more modified. But the general idea is this. 
that there must be an authority like God or like a king who would decide what is good, what is bad, what is just, what is unjust. There is no independent criteria for that. This idea seems nice. Seems nice. Because it seems that you have so much of love and respect for God that you want to make God above any moral criteria. They want to say God does not need to follow any moral norms. He makes the norms. God does not need to say you should be honest. He can say anything he likes. Because they thought if we say God has to observe moral norms, we are making God subservient. We are making God, you know, inferior. But we say what you are trying to do, maybe you have very good intention, but it's actually making decisions of God arbitrarily. You are not doing any service to God or believers by saying that God just makes decisions without observing any criteria, without observing any standards. We don't want to have this image of God that God as a, a tyrant, dictator, he just dictates and then after that we make it law. You know, in some countries, the king never violates the law. Everything that the king does is legal. Why? Because law is written after the king does things. So, so if he is not happy with some people working, then they make a law that these people cannot work. If they want to kill people, <laughs> they kill people and then they make a law. Okay, in this country, ne ne nothing is illegal. Why? Because law is decided according to the performance of the king and government. We don't want to think of God like this. He does everything and then after that we go and we make the law. No, it's not like this. It is said that there was a person who wanted to, you know, be clever. Of course, this is not cleverness, but some people think this is cleverness. So he said, we can have a competition for shooting arrow. And he said, I will always get the best result. I will shoot the arrow at the center, just very center. You know, they put signals, so I said, at very center. How? He said, look. So he shoot the arrow, and wherever it hit, he went there and drew a circle around it. Exactly in the middle was the arrow. Okay, this person always wins. Always wins, but this type of winning is useless. Okay? So, we don't want to think of God like someone who is making the norms just like this. He says something and becomes norm. We believe that there is real difference between honesty and dishonesty. Between helping people or harming people. Between keeping your promises or not keeping your promises. There is a big difference in reality. Even if we have no faith, even if we were not introduced to any religion, we still could sense that there is a difference between the two. And God the Almighty would only command those things that are good. Not that he commands and then we say, okay, whatever he commands is good. He commands good things. He asks us to do good things. What does it mean? It means that you should have a kind of understanding of Adl. And they said God commands you to observe Adl, justice. If justice is what is commanded by God, then does it mean God commands you to do what He's commanding you to do? When God says, Inna Allah bil ad, it means that you must have an Understanding of justice prior to receiving this command. An understanding of Ihsan. Benevolence before Ihsan is commanded. 
giving to the kingship. You must have an understanding of this. Okay, there are many arguments. I don't want to go into the details. But basically, this was a very important, and I still is very important discussion. And this is the foundation of our moral system, our moral theory. And the Shia, in order to express their very, their very particular way of understanding and interpreting justice, they made this as a principle of their faith. We believe in divine justice as something which can be understood and defended independent from religion. Of course, religion comes and gives us more details. Religion comes and gives us more sanction. Religion comes and corrects our mistakes. But for the basics of morality, we don't need to be religious. Actually, even in order to come to religion, we need to know basics of morality. How can you prove that this man who has brought you a miracle is a true prophet? If you don't believe in human ability to understand good and bad prior to religion, you cannot prove the truth of the person who claims to be a prophet, even if he has a miracle. Because one may say, okay, he has a miracle, but maybe God wants to deceive us. In order to deceive us, God has given miraculous power to a liar. How can you refute this question, this possibility? Still, you have not come to religion. Still, you want to establish the truth of this person. So you cannot say, based on the book of this person, God does not deceive. Still, you are not in the realm of religion. So how can you refute the possibility of a person who is showing miracle being a liar? The only way to disprove this is if you are able to understand basics of morality even before accepting religion. We rationally can prove that God as the necessary being, God as the absolute being, God as the most perfect being, would not deceive. You don't need to be a religious person, you don't need to read Quran or Bible to understand this. Deception is not something that fits into the absolute reality, which is God. So you have to understand certain things even before coming to religion. So, the Shia have stressed on divine justice as a principle of their faith, or denomination, or madhab. But, is it just something about God? It's a very important question. Is it just something about God? No. Actually, all principles of our faith, all principles of our faith, are not only something about theology, something about dogmas. All principles of our faith have impact on our entire life. We already talked about Tawheed, as you remember, and we said Tawheed is a principle that governs every aspect of Islam. We said even Islamic moral system is based on Tawheed. Islamic political system is based on Tawheed. Islamic model of education is based on Tawheed. Tawheed is everywhere. Justice is also the same. Divine justice is not something only that you remember or you believe as a doctrine. Divine justice has to be echoed in social justice. Can God be just and then he is indifferent to injustice happening in society? Can you choose divine justice as a principle of your faith and then you would be just looking about injustice happening in the world and either be part of it or just keep silent? No. The 
Quran tells us that establishing social justice is actually the aim of all the messages. In the book, you have this ayah, which is verse 25 of chapter 57. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم لقد أرسلنا رسلنا بالبينات وأنزلنا معهم الكتاب والميزان ليقوم الناس بالقسط. We have truly sent our messengers, all our messengers, with clear signs, and we sent down with them the book and the scale. Why? Why God has dispatched all these messengers? Why God has given them the book and the scale? So that people establish social justice and equity. It's very interesting. It doesn't say God doesn't say that he sent the messengers so that the messengers establish social justice. The messengers have not come to establish social justice by themselves. They have come to help humanity to rise and establish social justice. And this is the history of humanity, which is a constant battle for establishing social justice. But the universal social justice would never be established unless in the end of time. There would be local administration of social justice. There can be societies, Muslims or non-Muslims, who would establish social justice. But complete and universal social justice would be established by the one that the Prophet said So the mission of all the messengers would be completed by people under the leadership of Imam Zaman in the end of time by people not by Imam Zaman by people, because they have woman this, but under the leadership of Imam Zaman. If people in the time of the messengers didn't follow the leadership of the messengers and they were not able to achieve this, a time would come that humanity would achieve this. A time would come that no one would be deprived of opportunities for development. People would have access to best education. People would have access to job. People would have access to housing. People would have been able to live life of d dignity and honor. This is what is important. So, social justice is a very important implication of the faith in divine justice. God wants us to be just, and this is penetrating to every corner of Islam, especially in the school of Ahlul Bayt. In uh, some other places, like the book Shi Islam, Origins, Faith and Practices, and also in some lectures about characteristics of Shia Islam, I have explained how justice is highly regarded in Shia Islam. First of all, justice, you have to remember, for us is not only interpersonal. Some traditions, they think justice is between people. In other words, if you live on your own, there is no way to be unjust. For some people, if you live on your own, then you are not doing zulm to anyone. But for us, you can live on your own and still be unjust. You can be unjust to yourself. If you live in a cave and there is no one to bother, there is no one to annoy him, still you can be unjust. 
and that is to yourself. If you have talents and you don't develop, if you are lazy and don't improve the, your performance, your lifestyle, you are doing zone to yourself. If you don't live a life of piety, you are doing zone to yourself. If you commit sin, you are doing zone to yourself. Man yata'adda hudud Allahi faqad zalama nafsah. So, justice starts within. Then, justice is extended to the relation between you and others. You have to be observing the rights of others. It can be friends, it can be family members, it can be neighbors, it can be strangers, it can be enemies. Even with respect to your enemies, you have to be just. The Quran says, لا يجرمنكم شنعان قوم على ألا تعدلوا اعدلوا هو أقرب Do not let hostility towards some people make you unjust. Even if the killer of Imam Hussein lives in our neighborhood, we cannot do injustice to him. We cannot do injustice to his family. If he has done a crime, he should be receiving justice with respect to his crime in a legitimate court. But then we cannot say, okay, we have spread rumors about him. We annoy his family because he's a very bad person. No. You don't have any right to do any injustice even to your enemies. How far we are from that? It seems that we are not very close to that. I said, unfortunately, you know, we do harm even to friends, let alone enemies. Those who want to be helping Imam Zaman Sharif, those who have the aspiration of being helpers of Imam Zaman, first they have to check in themselves how committed they are to justice. If a person in family or community or in a place of work has wronged you, are you able to refrain from injustice or you take that as an excuse to go up and ruin that person. Like a person, for example, you know, that maybe said something bad about you, but then you do lots of more damage to him. If he did one degree of wronging to you, you make it 100 degree. This is not possible. Or you ruin the family of the person, the children of the person. So we have to be very careful. So justice starts from within, then is extended to others, even enemies, and even to animals. We cannot do zulm to even an animal. We cannot say only human beings, you know, are to be respected, even animals. Amirul Mu'min alayhi salam said. <laughs> لو أعطيت الأقاليم السبعة وما تحت أفلاكها على أن أعصي الله في نملة أسلبها جلب شعيرة ما فعلت. If I am given seven continents and whatever is under their sky, so that I do zoom to one end and I remove the peel of a barley. From the mouth of the ant, I will not do it. Many people would say, let's take the, those seven continents and you know we do lots of good things with you know, those continents. One ant is not important. But it's a matter of principle. A person who has principle in his life would not do anything wrong, whether it is for little good or great good or little harm or great harm, no calculation. When something is against your values, don't start wasting your time by calculating. If someone offers you, for example, a bribery, or if someone offers you an illegal, you know, for example, transaction, 
Don't say, let me calculate. I, I'm not going to accept, but let me calculate. If you're not going to accept, why you waste your time thinking about this? Never think about haram. Never think about something wrong. Amir al he says, when something is against my principles, even they give me seven continents, I'm not going even to consider it. Ma'afal. So, justice is extended even to animals, even to insects. You cannot even do zulm to plants. There is a beautiful flower. Why, you know, we should destroy that flower? Some of us, unfortunately, of course, sometimes, you know, we can cut the flowers because they need also to be cut, you know, in order to preserve them and, you know, use them. But not doing in the way that the whole plant will dry out. We have to be very careful. So, justice for us is something very, very important. And it can totally change the way we live and we behave. So it's not just God is just and then do what you want. <laughs> God is just, you have to be also just. God is just, then our moral system, our political system, our social system, our economical system, everything has to be just. Otherwise we are not true believers. Okay, I stop here and inshallah after break we continue. Wa akhiru da'wana alhamdulillah rabbil alamin. Oh.